Well, good evening. I just want to thank Earl for the opportunity of being able to speak to such an auspicious group. I've, I've always had a very high opinion of treasurers. I think they're wonderful people. And, uh, yeah, they, they're good people most of the time. Anyway, before we start, I just want you to see a very short video. It takes about a minute, maybe, and, and then, then I'll carry on. Thank you. Okay, so a quick question. You've seen the short video. When did Adventist Risk Management start? 1936. 1936, okay. And it started in 1936. Um, it's a department of the General Conference, obviously. And it started with a sum of $5,000. That's not correct. But you didn't see that in there. $25,000 is the correct figure. And today, it has sufficient funds to care for all the properties that are insured around the world. And Adventist Risk Management looks after the 13 world divisions. And the office that I represent is based in St. Albans, at the division office. And we look after six of the world divisions, the three European and the three in Africa. So we have a fairly large territory to cover. Um, and what, what are we going to do this afternoon or this evening is I'm going to cover two elements, property and general liability. So we're going to cover property first. And I think um, I'm going to try and cover it fairly quickly because I think you may have some questions. But essentially, we look after all the properties within the British Union, all the church properties. And... Uh, some of you may be wondering why we look after them and why it's necessary to have insurance. But the important thing on insurance is that we need to make sure that properties are properly covered and properly protected. Now, Adventist Risk Management doesn't only look after the properties, we also try to make sure that we manage the risk. And sometimes people complain that property insurance is too high, but after this morning's sermon, Elder Sweeney, we don't have to worry about the premium because all we need to understand is that we don't have to consider the money. <laughs> it's not important. Don't worry about the cost. The important thing is when something happens to one of your properties, you want it to be covered. And uh, I should mention before I start that the way we do the property insurance is that you tell us the value that you want it insured for. Now, technically, you're supposed to make sure that you insure it for its rebuild cost, not the cost that it would cost you to buy it. And one of the reasons this, this can be a, a problem for some people is quite often in today's society, we buy churches 
or the conference buys churches, and I guess Steve Keller will be talking about that at some point, but we buy churches at auction. And sometimes you can get a church for maybe £100,000, but the reality is that is not what it would cost you to rebuild it in the event of, of, of uh, a loss, whether it be by fire or storm or whatever. And so you need to insure the property based on its rebuild cost. Um, and so we insure on the basis of what we call TIV, which is the total insured value. And on that basis, if you insure a property for, say, 100,000, and its real value is 2 million, how much do you think you would get in the event of a loss? 100,000. And be lucky that you'd get the 100,000, because most insurance companies would work on the principle that if the real value was 2 million and you only insured for 100,000, they impose what they call a coinsurance clause, which would effectively mean you would only get how much of a claim? Hmm? How much? Well, you wouldn't get very much, but effectively you would get 100 over, well, 100,000 100, over 2 million, which is a very small percentage. But with us, we don't impose a coinsurance clause because our primary objective is to look after the assets of the church. And so you would get up to the full amount that you're insured for. So we are in the process of working on a, on a fairly complex issue with the various conference, the conference in the north and the conference in the south and uh, the, with the British Union to try and get all the properties valued at their proper values because this is very important in the event of loss. So we're working with that. It's taking longer than we had anticipated, but we're trying to get there. And so far, of all the properties that we have revalued, there is only one church that has actually been overvalued. One church. All the rest have been significantly undervalued, so in the event of loss, if you had a total loss, you would, you would have been in problems. Okay. So if we go back to the, to the screen, the insurance is just a part of the risk management process. The most important thing is to look at loss, good loss control. Preventative maintenance and good safety practice. Because, obviously, the more claims you make, the higher your premium becomes in the future. So if you can control your losses, this is all, all to the good. The way, the way, obviously, insurance companies work, and I have to say right from the beginning that Adventist Risk Management is not actually an insurance company. It's a self-insurance fund that the church operates to look after the assets of the church. So our primary objective is to look after assets. Our objective is not to try and find reasons not to pay. And I have noticed over the years there have been many cases where we have actually paid out on losses which possibly have question as to whether we should. But because it's our primary objective to look after the assets of the church, we do so. Um, so insurance seeks to restore an individual or the institution to the position they were in before the loss occurred. Now, that doesn't mean to say that you should be better off. You're only supposed to be put back in the position you were in before the loss occurred. And sometimes when we see claims coming through, we wonder whether it's actually a, a legitimate cost to the organisation. But we try to work with you. Um, now, obviously, we have to assume that the property is insured at its correct value. Um, going back to what I was saying a bit earlier, where properties are got at auction, we have one property in the British Union, and I'm just using it generically, the British Union, where we actually purchased a property for one pound. Now, that's a, a listed property. It's probably worth somewhere around six to six and a half million but it was purchased for one pound. So you can see where I'm coming from when I say that you shouldn't insure it for what you pay for it, you insure it for what it would cost you to rebuild it in the event of loss. Um, and 
part of the reason, I guess, that they want to sell it at such a price is because it's a listed property, it's very expensive to maintain. So the people that were selling it were quite happy to get rid of it and pass it over to an organisation that seemed happy to take on the liability. I have subsequently found out that the organisation that took it on, or the church took it on, think it's quite expensive to maintain. Um, but that's another issue. Um, actually, I had a call from the pastor the other day. I'm not going to say which church it was, but I had a call from the pastor the other day who gave me the impression he thought the premium was rather high because we have valued the church at, at the value it's valued at. But the reason it's valued at such a high figure is because we haven't actually purchased purchased it yet, it's being leased at a peppercorn rent of one pound until 2021, because the, the other party can't actually sell it until then, because of the situation that they took a grant, and if they sell it, they have to repay the grant. So we got round the issue by leasing it until 2021, in 2021 we buy it for one pound. Um, but the, the int impression was that this premium was rather high on this £6 million property. Um, and as I pointed out, uh, there have been two claims already in the last year on that property. So uh, we certainly haven't made any money on that one. Okay. So why is property insurance important? Can anybody tell me? Now that we've discussed this part of it. Why is it important? There are some people who certainly historically have felt that insurance in the church is not important. Um, I may have told this story before, but some years ago when I went to work in auditing at the General Conference, um, they always said to us that insurance was not something that Adventists get involved in because we have faith. <laughs> so we shouldn't get involved in insurance which seems to be a bit of a misnomer because at the same time in 1936 they set up a company to look after it. But one of the first things I found on my desk when I got to the audit department were a whole load of forms to fill in and I got to one, one set of forms and I looked at it and I said, well, this, this is insurance. And they said, no, 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 it's not insurance. I said, but it's, it's, it's life insurance. They said, no, it's not life insurance. I said, well, what is it then? They said, it's spouse survival benefit. <laughs> I was trying to work out what the difference between spouse survival benefit and life insurance was, and I still haven't managed to get to that stage. But I understand now that we do think that life insurance is important. And it is important because we've seen a number of instances um, over the last few years where some, some organisations in some territories, not the British Union, but in some territories have not taken out life insurance. And we had one very sad case not so long ago where a pastor was driving to prayer meeting in uh, one of the European countries and the roads were very bad in the winter and uh, his car left the road and he hit a tree and he was killed. And he had a wife with, uh, I think it was four children and one on the way and clearly she wasn't able to work and they had no cover whatsoever. So I think, you know, it is important that we look after our families, we need to make sure that where these things happen, that we protect our workers. And one of the most important assets that the church has are people. The people that work for the church are extremely important because without people, we wouldn't be anywhere. Okay, so, important to have insurance because we need to be sure that if something happens, we're covered and it gives you peace of mind knowing that you can replace the loss. And we had a case a few years ago where even the British Union, Victor, had a little, little hiccup. And uh, it was, I presume, reasonably comforting to know that at least you had some coverage there to put the union back to, to where it was before the loss. And actually, I suppose, for most of you who've seen the British Union, it's a better building today than it was, I would venture to say, a few years ago. Okay, so we talked about statement of values. Um, one of the other things I wanted to cover briefly is, is um, builder's risk. Um, that might sound a bit strange, but a lot of churches do 
additional modifications or extensions to their churches. And if you've insured your church for, say, a million pounds, and then you're going to do some extra work, you really need to cover that. Because during the, cost, during the time that the property is being renovated or improved, that will not be included in the, in the coverage. So if something happens, and it can happen during, the, during uh, uh, installation, that something happens and something goes wrong, and that additional cost would not be covered unless you take builder's risk. I won't go into all the details of builder's risk, but essentially it covers the materials that are on site, as long as they're looked after and, and not left open for somebody to come and take them. But essentially it looks after that, and as, as the work progresses, you, you uh, make sure that you keep updating the, the value. And then when the building is complete, or the refurbishment is complete, then you advise us that the building is finished and you add cost to the, to the cost of the building so that you're fully covered at all times. And that's uh, the, the disc on it, the builder's risk coverage. So it's during the course of construction, the amount of coverage shown should be estimated value, and, uh, but it doesn't give you content coverage. Now, that's another thing that we, we haven't talked about is contents. So you've got the buildings that need to be covered, and then you have your contents that need to be covered. And some years ago, we used to work on the principle that you had to give a complete list of all your equipment, content value, whether it be electronic equipment, property, all of it. You give us all that list, and then we insure it. That became very, very difficult to control um, because sometimes people would say, well, we've added another five computers, but they forget to tell us they got rid of ten old ones. So by keep adding, we were just getting higher and higher figures. And so we now work on the principle that we ask the local church to make sure that they have an up-to-date list themselves of the total value of individual assets you would notify us of the total value you want insured, and we will then cover you in the event of loss. So it's much better for you. It does mean, but of course it wouldn't happen amongst this, this group because everybody's honest here, but it could theoretically mean that you get coverage on something that you haven't paid insurance on. Because if you had a new property or a new, a new computer which you hadn't told us about um, and it got lost, we would still cover it, as long as it was within the value of the property total that you've given us. Yes? If the members are doing it? It would still be still be covered under, under builders' risk, but it doesn't. It wouldn't cover the actual member. Yeah, but we will come to those sort of things. Yeah. So basically, what insurance does is, is protection from fire, smoke, explosion, windstorm, lightning, ice or sleet, hail, sprinkler leakage, vandalism, theft, and burglary. Um, I've covered contents. There is business income in interruption, um, which we cover. But you know, I'm not going to go into all of that because I want to leave time for, for questions. Um, and then there's personal effects of others. So if, if employees, officers, or partners um, lose something, there is coverage under that within the policy, property policy. And then there's campus and students. But Giles will be talking about some of that later. Property not covered. Now, within all policies, there are things which are not covered. Um, so, what is not covered is underground pipes, flues, or drains. For some reason, we don't cover fraud and dishonesty if, if we're able to if we're able to identify it. Um, and we don't cover animals either, unless. Uh, unless they're specifically requested to be listed on the property policy. We don't cover motor vehicles either, because ARM tends to, certainly in, in outside of North America, only look after property. 
the, the motor vehicles that we do look after on occasions if, if you can't get insurance for them is ADRA vehicles in certain parts of the world where, where it's difficult to get uh, insurance. But generally speaking, we don't cover vehicles. And exclusions, wear and tear, faulty and defective design and workmanship. And I had this come up, uh, I think, on Thursday last week when somebody said, if we, get, if we get a contractor in, is it still covered? And the answer to that is no, because the contractor should have their own insurance to cover that kind of thing. You know, you can't cover faulty workmanship, and that's one of the problems, I guess, Earl, in, in the question you asked. If you, get, if you get people to do voluntary labor and they don't do it to proper standard, uh, it's certainly not going to cover that. Um, there's also a, what they call mis mysterious disappearance. Um, <laughs> no, we laugh about it, but it happens. Um, I went to a camp meeting in one country in Africa some years ago, and uh, a colleague of mine put his, put his iPad down at the side of him while, while he was uh, listening to the, the speaker, and uh, then they had prayer. <laughs> and and when, he went, when he went back, the iPad was gone. Uh, well, that was sort of mysterious disappearance, but actually I think it was theft, so we did actually cover it. But, uh, you know, so this mysterious disappearance is something which we're not totally clear when it's theft and when it's mysterious. But basically the, the, the definition of mysterious is if you don't know how it disappeared, but then you usually don't know how it disappeared if it's theft. So we, we sort of do cover them. Um, I should just mention another case in Africa that happened some years ago, and Giles, Giles told me about this one, I think. And that was that... Um, one, one church came back to us and said they were having problems that every, every week when they took up the collection, um, when they were praying after they'd made the collection, when, when, they, uh, when they finished praying, the money was gone. <laughs> and this seemed to be happening week after week. And uh, so they asked, what can we do about this? They said, what can we do about this? And uh, we said, we suggested that perhaps it was a good, good idea, since they were having this kind of problem, to maybe ha have at least one person who kept their eyes open. <laughs> because, you know, if, if it happens a number of times in a row, you have to get to the conclusion that somebody's whipping the money while you're not looking. And uh, so they did get one elder to actually keep his eyes open, and they found it was some children from across the road that were coming in. And they, they were, you know... Anyway, it was a bit of a problem. So you just have to watch that kind of thing. Renovation damage is also an exclusion. Um, governmental action. So if the government determines something's got to happen, you can't claim on that. Uh, nuclear hazard. War and terrorism is usually an exclusion under policies. Pollution. Uh, property in the course of demolition. You know, if you're demolishing a building by your own decision, you can hardly claim on the property insurance. We have had that happen, or at least they tried it. But, you know, it's, it's not really very fair. Um, earthquake is not covered, and flood is not covered. Now, the definition of flood is... is a little bit of a difficult one because it's, it's where it's a named flood. So in other words, if you have a storm which has a name, um, but generally water damage, of course, is covered. And earthquake and flood cover can be covered if you specifically request it, but then it's usually an additional premium. Um, okay. So I think I've probably covered enough. Um, I'd like to see if there are any questions before we go on to general liability. Because of the time constraints, Earl, I don't think we can go into all the details of policy because each policy is something like 132 pages. Um, but I do want to just make the point that when, you, when you've got your policy, it does list every single property that's covered. And it will list the value of the property that's covered, it will list the content value, and it's got the address. So we can look up on any particular event and see whether you're covered and for how much you're covered.
So Graham ARM is here. So any, any questions you've got on what he's just presented, uh, on your properties, your contents, anything you're unsure about, do ask him now. This is, this, this is your opportunity to get full clarification. Yes. Now, don't give me a hard time. Huh? <laughs> Some of these people like to specifically ask very difficult questions. No, I just want to get some clarification. Many of our members sometimes ask um, questions that are relating to the fact that when they look at their insurance covers, the premiums are a little high, and they say, um, <coughs> perhaps it might be better for us to get an insurance company down the road from where they are yes. so that they can be able to save costs. I told you you're a troublemaker. <laughs> Um, could you just enlighten us of the, the, the importance of um, working with the insurance that we already have within the, mm -hmm. the, the denomination, uh, um, uh, given that uh, it might be short term, uh, you know, cheap, it might be cheap in a short term way, but is, is there anything that we can enlighten us in terms of the yes. benefits of staying within ARM? <laughs> Well, there are, there are a number of issues, really. Um, first of all, um, just to give you a bit of background, I don't know how much you're aware of this, but all the churches are owned by the denomination. Now, there's a long history to that, but in effect, the Seventh-day Adventist Association is the organisation which holds legal title to all properties in the United Kingdom. Um, and that's done for a very good reason, because... In some of the countries where that was not allowed, uh, some of the former Eastern European countries uh, back in the day, properties could not be held by churches in a legal association. They had to be owned by individuals. Now, that's not a particularly good thing to do because what happens is, even though, you know, John, you may be a very good Adventist and the property at, in your church may belong to you, the fact is that when you die... Uh, I'm not suggesting he will, but when you die, the problem is that that property belongs to your estate. And what then happens is it goes to your heirs, and even though they might feel that, that they don't want to give it back to the church because it's your property. And we've had those kind of problems. And there's an also another issue that when churches are owned by the local church, when the church becomes disaffected, and wants to separate from the church, they take the church with them. Not physically, but you know what I mean. So all properties are owned by the organisation in a legal association. And yes, it's true that you probably paid for it or certainly contributed to paying for it, um, but they're all held in a legal association. Now, if, if the conference or the union were to allow each individual church to get its own insurance, there would be a problem because they would never necessarily know whether every church was covered because some, some churches would say, we can't afford it. Some churches would say, we don't need it because we have faith that nothing will happen. And if everybody went out to individual insurance companies, you'd also have the problem that every church probably would be covered at different, at different levels with different conditions. So there would be no standard within the system. And if the union were then to have to make sure every year that every church was covered, then you'd have to send a copy of your insurance policy to the union. They'd have to monitor it and make sure that it was acceptable. It would just be a, a horrendous task. Now, if the union unilaterally decided that they wanted to change the insurance company to another one, that would be a different issue. But I think that probably answers your question, Steve. Um, at least I hope so. Um, no, you don't have to insure with, with, with Adventist risk management, but the reality is, as I've said, we are here primarily to look after the assets of the church. We don't have any other reason for, for operating other than to look after the assets of the church. Yes? Um, my question is regarding property uh, uh, structure and repair. Yes. And what happens when that repair is undertaken by the, by the church, but then you find 
um, risks of asbestos and that sort of things. How, how is the liability then held specifically by the church or is there anything that can, you know, where you guys can assist the church or how, you know, how does that work? Well, obviously the insurance doesn't take account of, of, of asbestos and that type of thing in a property. That would be the responsibility of the owners of the property to get rid of it. Now, the issue of asbestos is a difficult one, but effectively my understanding is that if asbestos is in situ, it's not a problem. It's only when you try to remove it, or possibly when you try to sell a property, if someone knows it's got asbestos in it, it may make it very difficult to sell it. Um, but I don't believe there's any, any requirement to remove asbestos in a property as long as it's, it's, it's in situ. Yes? The, the, the problem is with the, the roof. So the roof is damaged, so it has to be repaired. Yes. But by the nature of the repair, because of the listed uh, nature of the building, yes. the planning permission now requires the entire roof to be uh, uh, changed. But the roof in itself is asbestos, so therefore it has to be removed. And therefore the liability now exceeds the ability of the organization, the small church, to deal with that. Yes. Is there any way in which assistance can be gathered or is that the full liability of the church? To my understanding that's the full li liability of the church because that's the maintenance issue. It's not, you know, if somebody stole the asbestos, now that might be a way of getting around it. <laughs> We've, we, we don't usually get people stealing asbestos. We have had people steal, steal uh, lead. The church that I was talking about a little while ago, they had the lead removed twice. You know, first of all, they had the lead, some lead removed, and then while the scaffolding was still up, somebody got up and took some more. Um, so we landed paying twice for that. But no, I, I, I don't believe there's any coverage for that. Um, unless you can arrange for someone to, uh, to steal it. <laughs> but the, there is another issue as far as I'm concerned. If, if some of the asbestos is damaged, my understanding, and obviously the council will tell you better, but my understanding is that you only have to replace that which is damaged. You don't have to remove all of it. They may try and tell you that, but it, that, that's not the case. You have to remove what's damaged, and there are special regulations of how you have to dispose of that which you're removing. But they can't make you take away what's, what's good and is not being, you know... Well, okay, I, I don't know. I mean, we had a case when I was at Stanborough <coughs> Press some years ago, and they tried to argue that as well. But we only had to remove something like 10 sheets on the whole building. And when you say like for like, obviously you can't get asbestos anymore, but you can get something similar to asbestos that looks like asbestos, and we just replaced it with that. Now, maybe the regulations have changed. I can't, I can't be sure, but sometimes they will tell you things that, you can usually get round if you if you work it with them, but certainly um, anything to do with maintenance, general maintenance, is not covered under any insurance policy. You're supposed to keep your property in good repair. Um, I mean, we have had cases where you know there's a, there's a water leak in in in, say, uh, in somebody's roof, and it does damage to the carpet, it does damage to the walls. And when the assessor goes around and looks at it, they say, this has been leaking for, for two years. I mean, an assessor can usually tell if it's a new, a new problem or if it's something that's been going on for a long time. Um, we had one church in the UK, I can remember, that uh, had a crack in the wall. Um, and they said, we've got a crack in the wall, it needs repairing. Um, but actually, when, when we looked into it, they understand the crack had been there for about 25 years. Um, <laughs> So, you, you know, we try to work with, with people as much as we can, but, you know, you've got to, you've got to be honest about things. Um, and I'm not suggesting that treasurers aren't honest. They usually are. But, um, you know. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, is there anything we should know about insurance when we're renting properties? Uh, oh, say, say that again, sorry. <laughs> is there anything we should know about insurance when we're renting well, if you're renting a property and it's still yours, then no, obviously... No, it's not. Sorry? It's not. You mean when you are renting? Yes. Yeah. When you are renting, and uh, obviously the person who, who owns the property is supposed to insure it. Now, they may charge you some, something in the rent to cover it, 
but you don't normally insure a property which doesn't belong to you. No, but what insurances do we need in those situation, in that situation? Well, it, it depends. We're not talking about property. Are we talking about property insurance no. now? If you're talking about general liability, I'm going to come to that in okay. a few minutes. All right. Um, there is there is an issue on yeah, general liability. Yeah. Any other questions on property? Sorry, no, it's not Steve. Any, anybody else? <laughs> Yes. And uh, because he's a member of our church, our church needs to be renovated. So it's only fair that we look after Brother John. Is it? What happens when, what happens when that takes place? Things start to go wrong. Well, when, whenever, you, whenever you get someone to, to do some maintenance or repair on the church, they are effectively a contractor, and you need to make sure that they have appropriate insurance to cover them for any any damage or bad workmanship they do you need to make sure you you should ask them to see their liability certificate you should ask to make sure they've got because otherwise you you land up with a problem that you're not going to get coverage on um, so I, I would say just make sure even and we're getting on to general liability now but even when somebody comes and and cleans your windows uh, mows your lawns, all this kind of thing, you should make sure that any contractor you use has appropriate insurance coverage for any damage they may cause. And believe me, they can cause damage. Uh, you need to watch that. And if you don't make sure, we'll get onto that in a minute with general liability, but if you don't make sure that they are covered, then you become liable. And when I say you, in effect, the church becomes liable as a whole under the general liability policy, which in turn means the premium for general liability goes up. Yeah. So I think we better go on to general liability now. Um, can, you, can you move the other one, please? Okay, when it comes to general liability, maybe I should just make, make a point here. General liability cover effectively covers you for third-party liability. So in other words, we've talked about property which covers the property you own. Now when it comes to general liability, this is covering the property of others. So let me give you an example. The church owns a property. In, in, the, pro in the property grounds, there is a tree. The tree falls over because you haven't looked after it properly. Now, I know that sounds silly, but you, know, you can't always know whether a tree is going to fall over. But if it did fall over and damage the next door neighbor's property, you would be liable. Your property insurance won't cover that, but the general liability insurance will cover it. So it covers the property of others. We had a case recently where some tiles blew off in the in the storms and hit somebody's car. The general liability of the church will cover that because it damaged somebody else's property. Um, now, one of the things I want to cover on general liability now is, is this. And, and uh, Margaret, you asked, you asked a question about insurance. Whenever you rent a property or use someone else's property, you are covered under the general liability of the church automatically. I don't know, I don't think the union charges out in this union for general liability, do they? I don't believe so. But in effect, the union pays for general liability or the conference. Um, we, have, we have three policies at the moment for, for the British Union. The union, North and South conferences, and they have general liability cover for all of the churches and all of the properties in the, in, in, in the UK. And so, if, if you rent a property, if you have an event somewhere, you are covered under the general liability policy. You don't need to worry about that. What happens is, very often, and we get a lot of this, and I need to raise a very important issue here, but we have a lot of cases where 
you actually rent a property and the people you're renting from will ask to see your public liability coverage or your general liability coverage. And the reason they want that is because they don't want to be liable. In the event that you do something on their property which causes damage or loss, they want you to take that responsibility rather than them. What you have to be careful of is you only take liability for what the, the, the liability you've created. If, they have, if they've got a building which has something defective in it, that's not your liability. But that would be fought out by the lawyers. Um, but in effect, the only reason you need a certificate is because you're asked to produce one in order to be able to use the facility. You don't have to have a certificate to be covered. You're covered 24-7 by the church, but very often they will ask for evidence that you are covered. Now, conversely, and this is another problem that we have within the church, whenever you rent from somebody, they will ask you for evidence of insurance coverage. The problem we have is that very often the church rents to other people. And unfortunately, we don't always ask the same in return. So, in effect, what happens is if you rent to the local social club down the road and you don't ask to have evidence of insurance coverage from them, you're going to land up with a problem because if something happens while they're using your property and someone gets hurt, you're liable. It's, it's the same thing with somebody comes onto your property. The way the law works is somebody comes onto your property, trips and falls, and they sue you. Now, they shouldn't be on your property in the first place, probably, but that doesn't make any difference. The law is such that they're always in the right and you're in the wrong. So you can put a sign up saying, do not come onto this property, don't trespass, blah, 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 but the fact is you'll be, you'll be liable if something happens. So you need to make sure that when you rent properties to somebody or you let somebody use the property, you make sure it's covered. We had a case in the UK, some probably about 2014, 15, where one of the local churches um, was renting their facilities to a table tennis society. And uh, what was happening was every week, the, uh, they would, they would, they would, the local society would tell, tell the local elder how many people were coming to play table tennis. And what he would do is then he would get out X number of tables so that they were ready. And he would say, don't go into the garage and get those tables out. I will get them out for you. You don't go in there. I've told you not to go in there. Well, one particular week, um, he got out a certain number of tables based on the number of people that were coming. And then more people turned up. But, of course, the local elder was at home having his supper or whatever he was doing. And they decided they needed another two tables, so they merely went into the garage to get two more tables. And unfortunately, the garage was, um, used to be used as a, as a garage, and it had a carpet. You, uh, not a carpet, a car pit. Uh, <laughs> a car pit. And so, in order to get to the tables, you had to walk across the carpet, which had wood across it to prevent you falling in. The only problem is the wood was rotten and the elder knew which, which planks to f step on but the individual that went in there didn't and he stepped in it and he fell in the pit and he hurt himself and, and there was a big issue over it and the elder and the church tried to argue, well, it's not our responsibility. We told him not to go in there. doesn't matter. You can tell him not to go in there but the fact is he did and you were liable because you, you didn't make the place safe. And I told them at the time it would have been cheaper to put a few extra new planks across rather than pay a big fine because they landed up having to pay all sorts of... Well, they didn't pay. Uh, the policy paid. But in effect, it affects your premium going forward. So all I'm saying is you need to, you need to think about that. Um, but the general liability covers an awful lot of things like that. It covers bodily injury... Okay, so basically general liability then is what I said. It provides comprehensive protection for church-sponsored operations. So coverage is provided against claims arising from negligence. So you, it always has to be proved that you were negligent. 
but in effect you are negligent if you haven't made sure something's safe. So, for example, in the local church, um, sometimes we find cases where you have a railing down the steps to go outside, or the, or the ground is uneven, or, or there's a, a dip in the thing, and if somebody walks outside and trips and falls, you're liable, you're negligent. You should have made sure it was safe. And, you know, whereas some of the younger ones of us <coughs> can, can walk down the step and may be okay, and if we trip and fall, we don't get too hurt, when people get to a certain age, um, and, and we've had cases, you know, somebody's perfectly healthy, and they get into their 80s and 90s, and a slight fall like that can finish them off. Yeah. Um, I mean, it does, you know. So you have to be very careful. So we cannot overemphasize the need to make sure that things are safe. And when, when, when railings are loose, or when, when wires are across the floor, I mean, look, we've got a wire across here. And that's rather good, because at least it's been taped down. So it's unlikely, apart from that one there, um, that, that anybody's going to trip and fall. But all I'm saying is you have to watch all that kind of thing, because if it can be proven that you're negligent, you're going you're gonna to be responsible, or the church is going to be responsible. Um, and it covers... We had a case... I've got to be careful, because I don't want it to sound as if you... Anyway, we had a case some, some time ago at one of your camp meetings... I think you were using, was it, I don't remember if it, no, I don't think it was Butlins, it was, uh, Pontins maybe, I can't remember which one. Anyway, one of them, and uh, at that particular one, there's a lot of moles, and moles tend to make holes in the ground and the grass, and so there were signs all over the place that said, do not walk on the grass, keep to the road, or the pathways, and a lady, um, in her wisdom, decided to cut across the grass and she tripped and fell and, uh, well, she damaged her face. She knocked her teeth or something and knocked herself unconscious. I'm not quite sure how you can do all that, but anyway. This was, this was, the, uh, this was the claim that came through and uh, she tried to claim against the church because this is another problem we have and I've never understood this. Um, if somebody hurt themselves on my property, John, I would not say, please sue me. <laughs> yeah? But for some reason, there are pastors in our denomination that feel if something goes wrong, they tell the local member, sue the church. <laughs> now, it's true that they may have a claim, but I've never understood why somebody would say sue me. But it seems as though we like doing that. And that's maybe a reason, uh, Earl, why you should start charging the churches for, for general liability and then they would realise that uh, it wasn't a good idea to start telling people to sue the church. Uh, the fact is you're covered. But anyway, this particular lady fell over, hurt herself and damaged herself and then there was a claim put in for a rather large amount of money to have reconstructive surgery on her, on her mouth. Um, and we pointed out that it wasn't actually our liability because the property had been rented from Pontins or whoever, and uh, so they should claim against them. Well, they tried to claim against them, but of course these big organisations, they have a lot of lawyers and they have a lot of, you know. So she didn't get very far with them, and so they came back to us and we said, well, we're not liable, but because the church is the church, we are prepared to give you up to a thousand pounds, or dollars I think, thousand um, dollars to help you with the problem as long as you can provide evidence that you've actually spent the money. And to this day I've never heard any more from the lady. <laughs> um, but, and, and the funny thing was that this particular lady, when you saw the damage or the pictures that had happened to her mouth, uh, and what she was trying to have reconstructed, because I think they were wanting something like £15,000 to, to do this work to her, and I was questioning in my mind whether she wasn't trying to have a set of teeth like a five-year-old. Um, and, and none of us have got teeth like that anymore, have we? At least most of us haven't. Anyway. Okay, so this is another important thing. 
General liability includes coverage for activities sponsored by the insured, even if they are away from their own premises or offices. Now, most of your public liability that you have for your house covers public liability. Um, if you look at your property insurance, you'll probably find you've got something like a million pounds worth of uh, public liability coverage. But it only covers you for your property. The general liability of the church covers you for any activity that you have anywhere as long as it's a church-sponsored event. So whether it's on your property or a rental property or even just outside having an event. So everybody here, in effect, is covered by our, by our general liability policy. So please don't have a problem. Um, so it covers all these kind of events. And it even covers Pathfinder programs and activities. And when Giles starts talking about that later, you might start asking why we need general liability and some of these other policies. Well, the reason is that those policies are very specific to a particular issue, whereas the general liability is more general. And the problem with general liability is that it affects the pre premium going forward, whereas the other one is just a premium you're paying for the, for the coverage. So it's cheaper to have some of these other coverages for those kind of things. Um, so who is insured? Employees. Only for acts within the scope of their employment. Volunteers only for acts within the scope of their duties. And church members only for activities authorised by the church. So you need to make sure that it's actually an event which is voted by the church board and which is something which the church wants to support. Because sometimes you get church members who think in their wisdom that what they've got to offer is something that you need. But it may be more for their benefit than for the church's benefit, and therefore it's important to make sure that it's an event which is sponsored by the church because ultimately the church is responsible by allowing you to hold an event on their premises. Insuring agreement. The company will pay on behalf of the insured all sums for which the insured shall become legally obligated to pay as damages because of bodily injury or property damage. There again, we're talking about property damage of others, not your property damage, to which this policy applies. Bodily injury. So bodily injury, sickness or disease sustained by a person, including death, resulting from any of these at any time. Property damage. Physical damage to tangible property, including all resulting loss or use of that property. And we had a case, not, not in the UK, but in Europe, not so long ago, where a church rented a facility. They rented it on an ongoing basis because they didn't have their own. And sometimes, for whatever reason, parents don't seem to have a lot of control over their children. That seems to be the case these days. I never seem to have that problem. <laughs> At least when they were young. Now it's a different story. Um, and so what happens is the children were not being carefully looked after, they were not being watched, and they were doing damage to the property by riding bicycles inside the building and damage the walls, etc., etc. Well... The owners of the property turned around and said, well, this is, this is your liability. You've caused damage to our property. And that was covered under the general liability policy. Um, so that happens. Um, personal advertising injury. So injury other than bodily injury arising out of one or more of the following. False arrest, detention or imprisonment. So if anybody gets... Uh, taken into custody, we might, might have to invoke this policy. Um, malicious prosecution. Wrongful eviction from a dwelling. And slander or libel. So if somebody says something about you which you don't think is true... Um, I should mention one thing that's very important. You can't claim on this policy and you can't sue yourself. So in other words, this would be outside organisations. So the Cardiff Church can't sue the Stanborough Park Church. 
you can't sue yourself because it's one policy, okay? General liability policy limits. Coverage A is bodily injury and property damage. There is a million dollars of coverage for any one event. Now, I should mention something here. Sometimes when you ask for certificates, you ask for five million, 10 million pounds because some of the councils in the UK want very heavy coverage when you have an event. You only have a million dollar coverage under the general liability policy that you purchase. Um, but we have coverage that the General Conference has through ARM, which covers up to a considerable amount. But you're only paying for the first million. Anything above that is provided by the General Conference. I say free of charge. There's nothing free in this life. And it probably means, Earl, that you get less appropriations or whatever through the division, or maybe you don't get any appropriations at all. But in effect, the General Conference covers you up to a rather large amount. And I'm not going to say how much it is, otherwise someone might try and put a claim in. <laughs> but the fact is, you're covered by the first million, and then the General Conference policy picks in. So if, you're, if you ask for a 10 million coverage for an event, it will say on the certificate one million plus the excess, and the excess you're not paying for. Um, now, there's one issue to remember. If you don't have general liability through us, which you don't have to, Earl, you could go outside and get it, then if you didn't have it through us and you didn't have it at all, that would be your choice, but the general conference policy would only kick in after the first million. So you would be have no coverage for the first million and then they would pick it up from there on in. So it could be rather expensive if you didn't have the first million. Um, okay. How am I doing on time? Am I? Huh? Sorry? I don't think we ought to mix his. <laughs> I told you, you know, they were all right when they were young, but they get difficult when they get older. <laughs> all right, I think the best thing is, rather than going through all the details, you are going to get a copy of the, of the presentations, um, not from Katie, but I think Lucinda has them on, on her thing. If anybody's got any questions on general liability, I'm happy to try and answer them. Um, but as I say, trying to cover all of this in, in the time we've had available is, is very difficult. Um, but I'm happy to answer any questions on general liability. Yes. Who? Oh. Yes. Yes. Well, obviously, if, if anything happened to your building and it was insured, then it would be covered yeah. under normal circumstances, unless it was fraudulently blown up or something. But on the assumption it was a general accident, your, your property would be covered under the property policy of the church. If your property caused damage to the next door neighbour, that would be covered under the general liability policy which is what we've just discussed. So any damage to the property next door that you're liable for, if it can be construed that you are liable, then it would be covered. I mean, there was a case some years ago where, have you heard of Japanese knotwood? Yeah. yeah. Well, there was, there was Japanese knotwood that came from the next door neighbour into the church property and through into the next door neighbour. And for whatever reason, it was... The, the, the damage coming from the next door into the church property didn't cause any damage. It really went under the ground. But the 
for the damage from church property to next door caused damage to the property. And so the general liability had to pay out for the damage caused to the next door's property. So. Sorry. Did you all hear me? No. What I said I, before. I okay. We have a long agreement with the Anglican Church. We, we hired their hall, and then it's been 10 years now. Uh, last year, they replaced the floor. They said they spent about 10,000 pounds to replace it. And then we've been asked, well, they asked to ask our lady members to not use sharp high heels. Yes. Which is, I don't understand why they, 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 don't, they can't stop using, but anyway. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, and then they said, we've been, <laughs> we've been warned that if we cause damage to the floor, we're going to be liable to, to pay. So how does that work? Well, uh, I've got to be careful on this one. Um, if you cause damage to someone else's property, it's potentially covered under the general liability policy, OK? So you should be telling the ladies not to wear high heel shoes in that facility if that's been the request. But if they do, it's like children. If you don't keep them under control, <laughs> you've got a problem. Your but time's definitely up, Graham. Your time's definitely up. I'm going to have to cut you. <laughs> anyway. On behalf of all the women in this room. The general, the general thing is that they sh it would be covered in all probability, and you should put a claim in. But I would say that people should be responsible enough if that's a condition of renting that you don't do it because obviously it's going to put your premium up if, if, if the general liability policy has to pay out. Hello. Um, I just wanted to find out, as treasurers, what are we covered for? Because I understand that um, we are only covered for 24 hours when we collect the money on Sabbath up to Monday. So what happens after Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, You're Friday? <laughs> what will happen if someone steals the money or if someone I get injured or something? Okay. You're, you're talking about money cover now when you're taking money to the bank? Yeah, but also me as the treasurer because I'm yes. at risk. Okay, well, effectively, you are covered for money um, as a minimum of £3,000 or 30% of your contents and electronic equipment, up to 100000 maximum. So, generally, probably taking money to the bank, 3000 is probably enough, but most people have got more than that, and it depends on your, on your particular coverage. You are covered for money in transit, okay? So if you take the money on Sabbath to your home, it's considered in transit to the bank. But you should get it to the bank at the earliest opportunity. Um, I, had, I had a church treasurer, and I haven't a clue who it was now, so if anybody's here and it's them, feel suitably chastised. Um, <laughs> they called me up specifically to ask me and say that they were going on vacation for three weeks and was it all right to leave the money in the house while they went? And the very fact that you ask such a silly question means that you don't think it is anyway. And so I asked them, would they leave that kind of money in their house while they went on holiday if it was their money? And they said, certainly not. <laughs> so the, the idea is you are covered in transit for money and you're not expected to bank it on Sabbath. So if it was stolen from your house over the weekend and you'd made suitable precautions to try and make sure it was safe, you are covered. But you should not leave it there for two or three weeks before you bank it. You then find somebody else who you feel is responsible enough to take it to the bank. And maybe, maybe the local church has to decide if you can't do it, somebody else does it. But 
you get it to the bank as soon as you can, but yes, you are covered in transit. And you're covered even if you're walking to the bank. Just remember, if you carry more than 10,000 pounds, you're only covered for 50% of the excess. So the idea is you take two people to the bank and you have 10,000 each and then you're both covered. <laughs> I asked the question one day, because that's the way the policy's worded, I asked the question one day, if you had 15 people on a plane and they were all carrying 10,000 each, would they be covered? And the answer is yes, because 15 people are carrying 10,000 each, even though they all go down at the same time. And I can't quite see the difference between that and the 15 people, one person carrying 15, you know, but anyway. Okay. One last question. Very, very quick one. Again. One last question. Um, just in addition to sort of money and cash cover, um, are, is there any cover for petty cash? which is sort of held just for minor sort of nipping out for toilet paper for the church, that kind of a thing. <sighs> Given that it is stored in a safe, um, but... If it's in the safe, it's probably okay, yes, because it would then be counted as, as, as loss, yeah. Okay. Um, the, the recommendation we have is whenever anything... You see, Claims department are the ones that adjudicate claims. And so our recommendation is, and we always say, if you've ever got a claim, let's put a claim in. The worst that can happen is you don't get it. But if you're talking about petty cash, the danger with that is that there's an excess on policies anyway. So unless the, excess, unless the amount of petty cash is greater than the excess, you're not going to get any money anyway. Right? And I think there's a £500 excess on the British Union policy. So, But... Depending, and, that, and you go over 500 pounds for a local church, probably, unless it's a very big church, it would probably be considered not to be very petty. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, all I would say is, if anybody's got any questions, we're gonna be here for a while if you want to ask us, and Giles will be giving you another in interesting time after supper. Okay, thank you very much, Graham. Uh, time, time has moved on. What I'm gonna suggest is, because it's now seven o'clock,